Denzi, hi. Hello. I'm talking Hello. to you. It's like it's like the the sound car. I'm I'm my Wi-Fi had um, that I've had to drive in my car and park up in a lane somewhere in the English countryside. It's like it's the worst kind of pervert loitering. I'm going to get arrested before we even finish this phone call. What I find so wonderful about this is that we spent a good 60% of our work on Homeland in a car. Um, so, so this is very comfortable. That is probably We did true. a lot of car mostly, work. We were in the back seat mostly. We were, we did, we, <laughs> but not strictly. There was, there was quite a bit of front seat no. uh, activity too. Yes. So anyway, yes, this is uh, simulating a very uh, familiar experience. Season eight, Homeland, congratulations. You've Thank finished you. eight years of Carrie Matheson, uh, which must have seemed traumatic at times. Um, were, you, uh, were you happy with where it ended up for you in season eight? Yeah, I was. I mean, the show asks so much of our characters and therefore our audience. And I think I I didn't want to bludgeon uh, Carrie or Saul or, uh, you know, or the people who have been tuning in for eight years um or eight seasons um and actually for us it was kind of subversive to give just a, a modicum of hope at the end so mm. i mean the challenge was to do the impossible really of of create some sense of uh resolution you know uh and 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 stay true to our character and our tone and also um uh give people a sense that the the central characters haven't been destroyed or ruined right and yeah you know i loved i loved the overall shape of the final season and um you know personally speaking how aligned Carrie was with Brody. I mean, she's been tethered to you from the very beginning to Brody. Um, and this was another way of um, acknowledging that. Um, and it just was very elegant storytelling, I thought, you know, it, um, really credit to Alex and his team. Um, but I thought that was really, that was really interesting and, it, um, and kind of romantic, actually. Um, but but yes, um, I I I I loved that she, her spirit was still alive because she was still doing her job, um, which was the thing that always made her whole. Um, and uh, and and you know it was she is a true patriot and is willing to sacrifice everything in order to realize mm. that um uh, so I, I thought that was quite moving um and i went satisfying. back to um i went back to uh when i was watching season eight and it was great to be in it again that was very right exciting. right right but um but uh, i went back to the beginning of season two because i was the bit of the series that i remembered least and i Mm -hmm. And I, it was, it was a great part of the series to go back to just after uh -huh. Carrie, after Carrie had been so certain that she was right. And we mm -hmm. meet her for the first two or three episodes teaching in a primary school. She's down, she's out, she's, yeah. she's sheltering in place with her family, but she's uh -huh. not happy. And that moment when Saul comes back, a bit of information and shows the video of Brody's suicide video. And her first response, and this is a very Homeland moment, is not 
God damn it, he's a terrorist after all, but I was right. And the sense right. of relief that she's not batshit crazy, which was mm -hmm. the delicious thing about Carrie the whole time. Her convictions, mm -hmm. her intuition, her instincts were mm -hmm. so strong. But mm -hmm. always she had to battle with self-doubt because of her mm -hmm. illness uh, right. and was always having to say it. Anyway, so going back to that moment was fabulous because then I came back to season eight and saw that moment in which is delicious in in episode 12 when you think my god she will stop at nothing to get what she wants and she is now going to have Saul killed and then they have a delicious homeland moment when and you're going to kill the thing you love and Oscar Wilde says you know we all we all kill the things we love so um anyway and she she escapes from that yeah. and then as you, you know, as you say, the hope at the end is there beautifully as well, I think, because she, that lovely twist at the end, she leaves that vital bit of information for Saul and Saul smiles. And in spite of the fact that he knows you've tried to kill him or threatened him, he, his love and respect for you runs, runs deeper. I'm still putting the pieces together. Yeah. I'm not trying to be evasive. I don't remember everything which is why you've been in a recovery facility and why you are going back. No. It was so fun delving into Billions and seeing your very robust and amazing afterlife. I mean, it was always nice that you were kind of under the umbrella of Showtime. Somehow that felt like you were nearby. Um, but yeah and i have just been released you know from this decade long uh uh experience uh of 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 being in homeland and i feel pretty raw and so you are like you're such an amazing <laughs> Uh, resource because you've been out in the world and you've you've um charted a whole other course and you've created a whole other culture and character and story and i just i'm really curious about what that was like for you um uh yeah to start again um in it, it, did it feel very different or not um yeah um they they are very different shows no no question yeah. um where, where homeland feels like a you can apply a sort of freudian analysis of every moment um right. millions feels apart from the obvious deep running theme of men and their fathers and probably the the afflictions of the fathers mm -hmm. um apart from that uh, it's a little more, it's almost Shakespearean, it's pre-Freud, it's uh, mm. evil exists, badness exists, mischief exists, badness exists just for the fun of it sometimes, and uh -huh. the characters need to be played with an Avengers-like relish uh -huh. sometimes. Uh -huh. Don't ask too many questions, don't ask right. for too much, uh, too much sort of... Um, you know, psychological background or uh, in the Freudian sense, and just 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 play what you have and play it play it with relish. The dialogue is is so much fun to play, um, and it does have a sort of Axe has a sort of comic strip. Um, he has a sort of comic strip invincibility about him, mm -hmm. um, which is fun. It's uh, and that is that is that is great fun to play. Um, that is great fun to play. Brody for me was always a pawn. He was always poor Brody. I always felt sorry for Brody. He was always a victim. He was a he was right. a victim in a larger game. Always. Right. Always. Right. 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 And those that was sort yeah. Of the difference, that's right. right. I mean, I mean, he was kind of so traumatized. He was he was claimed, you know, by these other forces, um, yeah. and yeah, was hosting all of these other influences and agendas and he was so broken he couldn't be fully integrated or even know who he was you know it was he was 
victim to that experience or something. You need that feeling you get when you see what no one else can and bet on that vision and be right. Because you, Taylor, are a profit-generating organism. You're just put together that way. That's what I need and why we are aligned. I've loved watching you play this Marvel man. But, uh, and I've, I, I've loved how, I've always loved how physical you are as a performer. You're especially gifted in using your body. And I mean, how lucky were they uh, to have found you? Because it, you know, and, and those glass box offices are really useful and kind of framing your, uh, your body. And I just think, you know, because it could be a story about numbers, you know, it could be kind of heady, I guess, even though it is um, sort of exaggerated. Yeah. But, but yeah. Um, y y you are, your viscera and your alphaness is, um, is really well kind of communicated with, with your physical self um and thank you you're so and your sense of play and playfulness you know it really makes him uh so much so engaging um and and enjoyable you know and you kind of um are on his side <laughs> despite yeah. how, how heinous he can be yeah well, this is it. I mean, it's it's an amazing thing. These these shows where we have these, um, you know, this golden age of TV, which we talk about incessantly, and but we've been in now for the last twenty years, I guess. Um, is is uh, we we love to see nuanced, complex, ambiguous characters behaving badly sometimes. If if the want or the need is great enough, and you can you can portray that need, that desire oh. enough. People really root for you. And I find that particularly in the States, there's uh, there's no, the, the thing going for Bobby Axelrod always is that he was a blue collar guy, that he came from nurses and, and police chiefs and fire chiefs. And he's from that background, from the Bronx, from Yonkers. And um, I think, you know, that tells a particular side of the American story, a guy who made it big, made a lot of money. Nobody really cares too much how you make it, is what I've right, realized. Right. It's just the yeah. fact you made it is good, and and the fact that you are then you have you are self, you sort of you you there's a coronation. You're the king. You're the king now, and and that's great because everybody wants to be the king, and it doesn't really matter too much how you how you get there. And I find that with Bobby Axelrod is people people love assholes being assholes. You know, just, be, just, you know, be it. And well, be they it do with it with relish. conviction and uh, consistency relish. and relish. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, think, uh, um, and charisma. People seem yeah. to like that. Anyway, but that was what, that was always the thing, you know. Uh, you know, I find uh, you and, you and, um, you and Paul are somewhat similar as, as co stars. Uh -huh. as, people to be opposite like you know uh it was always uh, our homeland stories always crescendoed to moments when we were together and right, similarly right. that happens in billions when paul and i come together and you both have such dexterity um and i i i was always amazed by you that you your facility for you just had such incredible access immediate and quick access both intellectually to the argument and emotionally and i suppose there was part of me when i was with you in that first season in particular thinking is this part of something that claire has learned or am i still with claire the little girl the younger actress who's already <laughs> had success in a big tv show and won awards and i i you had a you had a you had a, a a stardom already so 
was was that something that has just stayed with you when you're sort of unfettered as a 14 year old or 15 year old oh thank you again really that that's very touching um yeah i think it was but i think it's more innate than anything and actually i went through a kind of awkward period when i stopped acting and went to university college as we say um for and and didn't work for three years and um you know kind of went into hyper analytical mode and i had my my socks pulled way up to my knees and when i when i started acting again i was approaching it from a really cerebral place as if i was kind of writing an essay or something and i it was not effective that was problematic um and i had to um relearn how to just be um more intuitive and um and visceral and and just let myself real you know just allow myself to go into a a, a more kind of unconscious flow you know that that analytical work is essential in the beginning as you're kind of getting you're making sense of the narrative and the you know building the person but then it, you just have to you have to give yourself over to it but i also yeah. um uh felt i mean i loved my partnership with you on so many levels more than anything just the, um just making the scene happen um you were mm. um so present and so um so invested in and um and and spontaneous and really your sense of play is just special and unusual um and and a really really good time um so yeah i recommend anybody to to have have a shot at it um but uh but yeah and and i missed you so much when you left and it was it was amazing when you came back for that flashback in the fourth season and you know the nice thing about television is that you get to 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 live these characters lives in almost real time so that whole season was about carrie grieving the loss of brody and i was grieving the loss of you my friend and and acting partner um and um you know and i got to work through that in the fiction you know and and there you were yeah. this kind of ghost-like vision but 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 you were also actually there to to pretend yeah. to be it and um that was um that was a real surprise how powerful that was and and how valuable that was for for me personally um but yeah we shot that uh, in cape town mm -hmm. do you remember you had to yeah i, do, I remember it I vividly <laughs> i think the thing that i enjoyed so much uh was that we it really mattered to us my god it mattered it was so important and you think oh, i can make a tv show I'm just saying, uh, but the it was so and the truth of the story was so important there was such sincerity from everybody and i remember our i remember our weekend you know the cabin you know the famous episode of the first season where we went out to the cabin and and we do you remember we talked and we talked oh my god and then you lost your shit with me but you got angry with me because i i did a stupid walk and you were still in the middle of the scene and i went away and did a goofy walk and you were like God, Damien, that is not okay. That is not okay, Damien. I was going, Christ, what have I done? And then I and I realized, <laughs> and I realized that I had done this goofy Monty Python ministry of silly walks walk as I walked past the apartment who are hidden behind a barn, totally forgetting you were so close up. And because I was like three <laughs> yards away. I sort of went like this to make people laugh. 
and you were still in the middle of this thing. And it was at the end of that day when we had spent with Michael Cuesta and then Alex Ganza was there, Alex was there, we were all there together. But it was a particular nuance trying to thread the truth of that part right. of the story. Right. Who was playing who? Was there real affection? And how were we how were we just going to pass it out in the most delicate way and truthful way possible? It was an intense couple of days, my God. It, it was really it was, intense. But that's 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 the fun, isn't it? That's that's apart from the joking between you know, and the banter and the stuff that you do with people that you like and who are fart, fart who are smart and funny and and witty <laughs> and interesting and talented people, which they everyone was on Homeland. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as they are on Billions too, actually, we have so much fun. But it's actually the yeah. intensity of the work, isn't it, that you really remember too, whether it was you know, whether it was important or not. And the homeland always felt so important, didn't it? Mm. I think, I think. Yeah, it, it did, it did. And I was always, I, I don't know, I, I, I was then always looking back to you as Carrie, you know, to Brody. I mean, she, and she has other relationships, sort of, but that was really the central one. And, um, you know, I miss those days when she was more in the present tense. That just was kind of gone for her and therefore for me, um, which I'm only kind of realizing now as I'm talking to you. But, but you know, she was like living with a ghost um, yeah. forevermore. Yeah. Uh, and, and she was living with a ghost to begin with. I mean, I think the trauma of 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 feeling responsible for what happened at 9/11 was also kind of a, a source of haunting for her. I mean, she was haunted by that. I mean, she's haunted by a lot of things, um, by her illness too. But um, somehow, she she was more in the present tense, and she was more in her body and uh you know when when she was with brody you know um yeah. and 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 falling in love i mean I, I i think you said before that it's always true that these relationships which are this you know um um kind of politically oriented but they're also deeply personal and 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 um, and involve a lot of intimacy and and love and w w it's hard to gauge when that's real or not um mm. always and it was between Carrie and Brody as well but i think the great surprise to to her certainly was that it was much more real than she had any any awareness of and I don't know that that you was were great, true in the same way again. No, mm -hmm. well, but, but you were laugh. You know, Carrie did so many questionable things. Uh, there were times when she was truly, times times when she was sincere, and times when she was entirely duplicitous. She, right. But you right. were you you acted her without any sentimentality, any vanity, and it, it, the, the success of the show really rides on the back of that rigor that you that you brought to it that that was that was essential that that role was was played honestly like that i remember having a conversation with you i think we were talking about acting once in the in the trailer and i remember you just saying i think you and i were joshing around actually and you know i was saying well brody's not you know brody's this that and the other and you were going no he's not and i said yes he is and, and you said and he said oh god you're one of these actors that probably you like you defend your character at all costs and i said i what? no, i don't actually uh no and um and i <laughs> i was just saying but it does it, it i think about that in acting i remember you saying at some point during that conversation know the story you're telling 
which is an essential thing for every young actor to know mm -hmm. is uh -huh. you can't you can't be liked in every role do things mm -hmm. which are uh, ambivalent and and you have to know what part of the story you are there to fulfill and if you're mm -hmm. playing the arsehole you're gonna have to be the arsehole don't try to be liked because it skews the story um mm -hmm. and you were totally unvain in 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 that respect and uh were happy to be unlikable when she needed to be unlikable and 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 not at other times and i thought that was that was that was so admirable um you know whilst at the same time which is what i believe in a, a, about acting which is you do advocate for your character you must advocate for your character yes. defend them defend them to the hill and what i mean by that is not defend them in the real world but within the terms of the fiction of the story just offer the best and most credible defense for them and right, then right let the audience be judge and jury so you don't you don't prejudge you just you play them to the hilt and that is in itself advocacy for them and mm -hmm. then, and then, yes then yeah. the audience will decide there's nothing to tell let him talk you told president warner he should come to afghanistan i didn't know warner was going to take me up on it i had no idea until i showed up at bagram and air force one was on the fucking tarmac there's a full hour between then and the helicopters going down enough time to make a phone call i'm staring at my beard i would just like to i'd like to congratulate your husband on his season eight beard that's that's mostly mostly what i followed around the screen was his beard. <laughs> it was intense that was uh gave, that was all him too he gave good beer. He decided just, that 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 neo fascist would look that way, and um, Hugh, yeah. Hugh gave Hugh gave good beer. I'm just saying. Yeah. Um, well, so I'm curious to know um, what it was like for you to go down the rabbit hole of of finance. Um, I, I mean, did, is that something that you that you had to? kind of bone up on or or yeah. read about or know, I mean, know anything about yeah um, because yeah. i yeah. am still you know woefully ignorant about all of that well i gotta tell you i i did not know a lot about how hedge funds worked um, right i knew i had a sort of i had a a really distant relationship with long selling and short selling um I now know all the mechanisms, how you short sell. I now know that there is, um, and you know, just to pick up on the point you were making earlier, that it's the show succeeds in being personal. It succeeds in being as much about relationships as it does the deal, which is why I think Brian and David have done such an amazing job with it. Is is there's always a grift going on in billions. There's always a con, right. so. So I so that I think that's a success, you know, in terms of the writing of it, definitely. Wow. I knew you were racked with guilt, but this takes it to a whole different level. Sure, the roads were paved, but I didn't even have a goddamn car. Now, you see, this is where we are different. I don't pretend I'm an ordinary guy got lucky. I am a monster. You know, the, the, one of the fascinating things to me was that the hedge fund industry really doesn't consider itself Wall Street. It's hardly any of them are located in Wall Street. They're either in Midtown or they tend to be out in Greenwich and uh, Westport, places like that. And they are real. They're, they're, they're sort of hostile agents to Wall Street. Mm -hmm. All the Wall Street, the big, uh, the, the CEOs of, um, you know, of all the, of all the Dow Jones uh, index companies, uh, they have protocols that they go to should they hear of a, a takeover from a hedge fund and they have emergency protocols that they can go to immediately get their board around the table and uh, work out what they're going to do, how they're going to resist a, a takeover, especially from an activist um, hedge fund guy, which Bobby Axelrod is, uh, mm -hmm. which in the old days would have been called asset stripping by any other name, you know, go in, clean out, clean up. Um, but there are lots of interesting, there are a lot of interesting 
are interesting characters out there. You know, there's there's a hedge fund guy who teaches at your old university at Yale, teaches about how we have a responsibility as as activists within the market to clean up bad companies where uh, the stock price is perhaps overstated and where companies are underperforming and there's inefficiencies because board members and CEOs are taking big fat cat salaries and the shareholders aren't seeing proper returns on their dividends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they believe there is a moral responsibility to go and to clean up the economy. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating world, Billions. It's a world of contract. Uh, and it's a world where uh, you might do something good for someone, but probably only if there's something in it for you too. Uh, there's, there's very little, if any, overt altruism in the world of billions it's it's kind of uh it's a it's a little bit of a cynical worldview but it's probably at least in that high octane high powered political and financial world of new york and the big urban metropolises around the world accurate mm -hmm. i would say Right. Did you did you talk to a lot of folks within that world? I mean, did yeah, you know, did did the research that you would normally do, I would normally do, go and talk to the guys and you know, find out when and visited some offices and you know, they range from guys who have thousand dollar haircuts to guys who just schlob around in sweatpants and they're all as rich as each other. You know, um, mm -hmm. some people like to display their wealth. Some people keep it very, very hidden. They prefer it that way. Almost all of them said that they were risk averse. You know, the idea mm -hmm. of the financial world being a casino. They all say they're risk averse. What I now know that means is yeah. that their analysis and their research is so comprehensive mm -hmm. and they will get information pretty much by any means possible so that all risk is eliminated and that uh -huh. i mean you can read between the lines what that means but uh to eliminate all risk usually means you've got to know something that you probably shouldn't know but i think that's uh -huh. and that's what they call the black edge they they all want that edge uh black edge dark edge I think I'm going to go for dark edge and they, so they, and they, they want that edge and it's, and it's known as the edge. And how do you get the edge over everybody else? And that's where you, that would seem really helpful. It. Like that would be, that would be something that I, I would return to and extrapolate from, I guess, you know, be, be, if I were thinking about playing somebody like that, I, I just, um, I don't know. Cause, cause kind of, I think it's why what, I think it's why it has. Them, right? That's right, and it's also what gives the show, rather than being a dry show about numbers, as as you said, um, it, it could be in danger of being. It's it's really a, a gangster show, is what it is. Right. It's about yeah. It's about people being gangsters, pretty much, pretty much, and to that end, it's great, great fun. So that and that's why it's so fun to play.